All right. Hello, everyone. Um, hold on just a second. I'm just uh, getting a little organized here. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Let's see. We've got pun on. Uh, we've got pun on the view. Not sure. Uh, let's see. I don't know what's going on there. I think we've updated that. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, welcome to A4's November Town Hall. I'm Lisa Gold, A4's Executive Director, um, Quick Accessibility Check. I'm a HAPA, uh, half Asian, half white woman with dark shoulder length um, pandemic hair, wearing a black and white blouse. Uh, set against a backdrop of a lot of artwork and a, and a brick wall. Um, those of you who are town hall regulars will be happy to know that Maka, my dog, is here and uh, she may make an on-camera appearance later. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us. I'm looking forward to seeing your faces later um, in the evening. It's going to be great when we can do this in person again. Um, so um, tonight, in celebration of the recent election and the really epic increase in voter turnout and engagement, um, we're keeping the momentum going and we're talking about dismantling the status quo. So, um, you know, as I've, as I've stated in previous uh, town hall events, there is just way too much injustice in the world and it can feel overwhelming to go up against the system. Um, but we as artists have this unique power and we can use our creativity and our networks to affect the change that we wanna see. And so I am incredibly inspired by uh, tonight's speakers who have been creating these great projects and works to bring attention to the fact that business as usual is no longer acceptable. And uh, again, so I thank you for being here and for uh, doing what you do. Um, those of you who are familiar with A4 uh, know that we are dedicated to ensuring greater representation, equity, and opportunities for Asian American artists and cultural organizations through resource sharing, promotion, and community building. Um, Town Hall is one of our signature programs that helps us fulfill that mission. Um, so is anybody, I guess, I think we have a, a lot of people who have been to uh, Town Hall events in the past. Yes, I don't know. You guys can um, raise your hands if you know how to use the, um, Zoom protocols. Um, there is a raise hand function um, that is accessible by clicking on the participants icon at the bottom of your screen. And then um, we're, we're also, I wanted to let you know that we are recording this for our YouTube channel and it is streaming um, live right now on Facebook. Um, and I would like to ask you to also mute yourself um, if you are not speaking right now. So here's how tonight's going to go for those of you um, who have not participated. And even for those of you who have, um, we have a very um, a small group of presenters tonight. So what we're going to do, we're going to shake up the order a little bit. Um, we're going to have our two featured presenters go first. And then we're going to have the group of um, people who registered to pitch. And usually these pitches, um, the short pitches are one minute. But because we only have a few people presenting tonight, um, everyone gets two minutes. Um, and if you go over your two minutes, I'm not going to be as harsh um, about muting you as I normally am. But don't abuse it. Okay. Um, so after our, our second featured presenter, I'm going to call the names for people giving um, the short pitches. And your names will appear in the chat box in order. So be please be ready to go when your name is called. Um, and then after all of those people go, if there's anybody else, um, who would like to make a, a short 30 second pitch about a project or whatever, um, I'll just put your name in the um, put your name in the chat box. And also you can um, raise your hand and I will um, I will call on you in that order. Also, please make sure to um, write your social media handle or your website in the chat box. So after you give your pitch, people will know how to follow up with you. Um, and then after all of this, we'll have some um, breakout room conversations so you can follow up um, or introduce yourself or ask questions or whatever. Um, I think we'll have time for at least one 10 to 15 minute session to mingle. And if you'd like to switch breakout rooms at any time, you can just message me through the chat and I can move you to a different room. So if you wanna meet as many people as possible, 
um, we're going to try to facilitate that tonight. So a um, couple of quick announcements first. Um, first, I want to uh, I want to thank Ibi Ibrahim, who is our programs and communications manager for his work with A4. And regrettably, um, Ibi is leaving tonight um, after he's leaving A4 after this event. Um, and Priscilla Sun will be stepping into the role of programs and communications manager. So um, thank you, Ibi, for all of your work. And Priscilla, um, we're excited to have you. Priscilla comes to us from NIFA, where um, the New York Foundation for the Arts, where she was um, most recently the program officer for fiscal sponsorship and finance. So she knows a lot about what artists need. Um, uh, let's see, I had mentioned that we are live streaming. If you want to share anything about tonight's event via social media, please use the hashtag um, A4 Town Hall and be sure to tag us. That would be great. Um, and also, um, please help us do better. Um, fill out the post event survey. We will put it in the chat. We will send it to you via email, um, but it just helps us figure out what we can do better next time. Um, or if you have ideas, suggestions, whatever, please, um, we read these, we read it and we act on it. So let us know what's happening. Um, a couple of quick announcements about upcoming A4 events. Um, next week on Thursday at six o'clock, we are presenting um, the first of three discussions around the concept of reimagining diversity um, in conjunction with um, the eighth floor, which is part of the Rubin Foundation. Um, their social justice space. So this, this event, this panel discussion called uh, What Does Racial Diversity Look Like in a Race-Specific Organization uh, will feature leaders of um, three um, racially specific organizations, the Asian American Writers Workshop, uh, Shade Lithcott of National Black Theater and the Coalition of Theaters of Colors, and um, Natalia Salgado of the America's Society and the uh, Collective Se Habla Espanol. And it's gonna be moderated by um, Rebecca Kelly G. So um, please watch that, it's gonna be on Zoom. If you wanna learn more about that, you can um, check our website or our newsletter. And then we have two more discussions after that, also addressing uh, the themes of diversity from a POC standpoint, um, POC, POC, BIPOC, POV. Um, anyway, so those will take place on December 10th and 14th. It's going to be a really great um, um, series. And I'm super excited um, to announce the launch of a pilot program, A4's virtual residency program. And um, this project, this was created for um, artists who've been sidelined and isolated due to the pandemic, and it's going to help them build um, a safe and supportive cohort to support each other, to give feedback, to give you that nudge that you need to get in that application or finish that screenplay or whatever. Um, and it's, um, you know, we're encouraging people to build this network, share resources, support each other. Um, there's more information about it on our website. The deadline to apply is Sunday, November 22nd at midnight. Actually, I think it's 11.59 PM. Um, and it's a really super simple one page application. Um, and um, I will pop that link into the chat box later, um, or you can you know, reach out to us with any questions. Um, and then our next town hall is gonna be January 19th. Um, we don't have a theme yet for that. So if you have ideas, um, you can, let us know on the survey or you can email or again, just drop it in the chat. Um, as always, um, we wanna thank our supporters who make Town Hall possible. And that is um, the good people at uh, Con Edison, Capital One, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, um, the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature, the National Endowment for the Arts, Race Forward, the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, the Tiger Foundation, and so, so, so many generous individuals. So thank you all. Um, and if you wanna be among our list of supporters or you wanna test our new and improved uh, text to donate function, then you can text A4DONATE to the number 202-858-1233. Um, and you can pay with Venmo or Apple Pay or a regular credit card. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's that, um, if, you, if you are so inclined. Um, 
And uh, so before the pandemic, before the whole world was uh, virtual and on Zoom, uh, we would be meeting in the A4 offices um, in, in Dumbo, which are on the unceded lands of the Lenape and Canarsie peoples. But since we are meeting virtually, I would like to share a digital land acknowledgement written by Canadian theater artist, Adrian Wong, as we're all um, occupying uh, different physical spaces. So um, here we go. Um, since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking that we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art that we make leave significant carbon footprints and contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join me in acknowledging all this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good use of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. So now I would like to introduce our first featured presenter, Amy Koshman. Amy is an Iranian American, Brooklyn based artist, activist, educator. Uh, her practice builds bridges between. Um, disparate communities to counteract fear with a collective sense of radical acceptance and who doesn't need less fear and more radical, right? Um, her work has been presented at venues from Socrates Sculpture Park to South by Southwest and she's participated in numerous high profile residency programs and I could go on and on and on, but um, you can hear directly from her and learn about her work at uh, tinyscissors.com. We are so excited to welcome Amy tonight. So, here you go. I give you uh, Amy Koshman. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and thanks to the Asian American Arts Alliance for having me here to speak and for all of you for attending um, and Evie for bringing me into the fold here tonight. So I um, wanted to start, I know I have a short amount of time, but I always kind of like to start by acknowledging that we are bodies in front of these machines that we might've been in front of all day in front of these screens. And so what I'd like for us to do really quickly is to just do, because I know, you know, if you're anything like me, I'm a news junkie. I've been doom scrolling now <laughs> for weeks and weeks and months and months. And so, um, one thing that helps me, and it's just very simple, is if we can all just relax in our chairs for a moment together and just kind of come to a comfortable seat. And if you're, you know, we're going to slow down for a second, we're going to take some deep breaths together because I'd like for us to all kind of become present in the space together. So as you find your seat, wherever it is, chair, bed, floor, just go ahead and close your eyes for a minute. And when they are closed and just, just trust it, just go with it, just go ahead, relax, close your eyes. Take a moment here to reconnect with your body, with your breathing. And let's just take a few deep breaths together. So we're gonna be inhaling through our nose and filling our chest and exhaling and sighing it out through our mouths and letting it all go. So on three, we can breathe in. And let it all out. We're gonna do a couple more of these just to calm our body down, to remember that we're grounded, we're supported and we're empowered to make change through our grounding. So let's take a couple more deep breaths just at your own pace, breathing in. And now,
One more. And this one you can breathe in as deeply as you want and just really let it all out on the exhale. And whenever you're ready, if you haven't already, you can open your eyes. And you can come back to this present moment we're in together. Thank you so much for humoring me. If you didn't do it, I respect you. I see you too. It's totally fine. So I just wanted to do that because a big part of my practice is just bringing people together and as Lisa mentioned, creating bridges between communities and in this moment, just kind of orienting all of us towards being human, being connected and feeling that through this connection, even if it's just through breathing, that we're all in the space together, we're all activated and we're all ready to participate. So I on that, EB, do you wanna put my um, slides up? Yay. So um, with, with that kind of connection and that kind of um, uh, sort of more meditative work that I do, I started a group called Emotional Aid that I've been doing weekly ever since the pandemic hit. And it's, it's really, it was a place for artists and activists and um, other folks to come together and to kind of vent as well as meditate and do mindfulness practice so that we can become empowered and we can remember to sustain our energy over time. So what you're seeing here is a slide from a um, march I helped organize with a group called the Wide Awakes. And this is a group that if you're at all interested in thinking about dismantling systems and orienting towards connecting both art practice and political engagement, the Wide Awakes are a group that's national and it's moving international um, that are all about civic participation and civic joy and civic spectacle. And so in this slide that you're seeing, I was leading a, a march called the Vote Feminist March on October 3rd that started in Times Square and went down to Washington Square Park and then to Federal Hall. And the idea was how do we get folks activated around getting out the vote, making sure they understood that this was like one of, well, not one of the most important elections because they're all important, but this was a super important election to actually participate in. And so I was chant leading and we all, you can go to the next slide, EB. We all made capes and flags and brought just this huge amount of, um, energy and like I said, like Guy Debord and Society of the Spectacle, the Situationist is another group um, that I kind of think about when I think about artist collectives that really engage with this idea of creating social action and, um, and change. And so we, we marched and this is a group that I continue to participate in. This is a group that I would actually um, suggest that all of us join if anyone's interested in joining um I want to kind of look up the let me just look up the um the yes the wide awakes here it is so I'm putting it in the chat right now um cape on and it's orienting and the history of the wide awakes is that they're a youth organization um that was orienting around um, emancipation of slavery and abolition. And um, this was back in the 1860s. And so it's about bringing back those ideas, connecting what's happening in this historical moment through the movements of black liberation and the abolition work that we see now in the mainstream consciousness and connecting that back to a historical um, precedent. So you can go to the next slide, EB. So a lot of my work, and I'm not showing like the like kind of sexier work that I've done at institutions like the Whitney and, um, and the Guggenheim and other places in the past. What I'm showing now is what sort of happened with my practice in a post COVID moment where I felt like a lot of the um, 
social practice and arts activism that I was doing within the art institution was something that I really felt needed to break beyond the institutional wall and kind of move out into the street. And so another project that I've been working on um, is with collaboration also with the Wide Awakes um, and with prison abolition groups, critical resistance and no new jails and um, Sunset Park Popular Assembly. So thinking about how do we create intersections between artistic practice and literally grassroots organizers so that we can create this change that we want to see. We can actually use the spectacle and the press that we bring to our practice as artists out in the streets to raise awareness about campaigns and um, issues that actually need a lot of attention. So for this example, this is at the um, Federal Prison Metropolitan Detention Center, actually in my neighborhood. We need help in raising awareness about this. So we started um, doing these actually art events out in front of the jail. You can go to the next slide, Eb. And we ended up bringing um, musicians and um, performers out so that it was not only to raise awareness for Jamel's case and raise press, it was so that artists and musicians and creatives could actually get activated in um, direct action organizing for people who had never been activated before. As well, in this instance, we're bringing music and um, art to the actual prisoners on the inside. And so we have an actual letter writing group with the prisoners inside the institution. And they were we were asking them and querying them who they wanted to see perform. And we got folks that said that they would like to see classical music. So we brought this music group, Public Quartet, which is an incredible string quartet that has performed at the Met Opera, et cetera. And they um, put on this incredible show. And so Evie, if you go to the next slide, you can play this little clip. <laughs> No justice, no justice, no peace. Free the NBC, free the NBC, free the NBC, free the NBC. Say it again. Cowboy, say it again. Cowboy, say it again. Cowboy, say it again. Even say it. That's the trouble. Cool. So the reason why I wanted to show this clip is because Curtis, who is the person that you're seeing performing um, along with Janina Norpoth, they had never been to a protest before and they had never participated in any kind of action like this. And it was really energizing for them and they continued and continue in organizing with us around the jail and in other abolition work that we're doing. And so it's again, when we think about dismantling systems, it's really about using all of our resources, all of the people in our spheres of influence, our friends, our family, the creatives that we know, the people in the arts community, the activists, the organizers and our elected officials to really think about how do we create a holistic system to move towards change? How do we create inroads for people to feel like they have agency to actually get involved? So for people that, you know, how would you get involved in prison abolition work if you're a musician? And it's like, well, actually by doing and performing in this way. And so if you go to the next slide, Eb. This is another um, 
sort of example of trying to bring people together around this idea of abolition. And when we talk about abolition, so let me just back up and clarify terms because that terminology gets thrown around a lot. It literally, and the reason why I wanted to show this work for this panel is because it's literally about dismantling harmful systems and creating communities of care. So specifically, I'm doing work to end the prison system, the carceral system as we know, um, to end policing and the police state, because as we know, and as we have seen, these are systems of systemic oppression and racism that have been in place for hundreds of years. And with the, with the case of um, the police, that system in our country has only been around since the 1800s. And so when we're thinking about dismantling systemic oppression, these are some of the ways to do it. So this is a trailer for um, a longer video that I did that was part of a performative event um, that brought together city council candidate Whitney Hu, abolitionist organizers, and the artist Macon Reed to think about, again, strategic ways to talk about these ideas. So this is a polyamorous dating show um, <laughs> that brings all of these folks together. You can play the trailer now. Against Doom TV, this is the Love Triangle. Thank you, everyone. Now, let's meet our eligible bachelorettes. Now, Whitney, tell me your secret fantasy. Ooh, I think mine would be a world without prisons. I'm really in this to try and achieve abolition in our lifetimes. What's love got to do, got to do it. Is this on? And that was the event. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> That's a much longer video and I'll put a link in the chat, but it was such an interesting dialogue because it literally, we created this sort of absurdist frame and thinking about using absurdism in the, in the um, practices of the Dadaists and other arts movements where we've seen, you know, even in thinking about like Sun Ra and the Afrofuturists, um, it's about sort of bringing color and bringing humor and bringing absurdism to talk about super heavy socio-political issues. So it, it worked. And this is a, this is a structure that I'm going to be using moving forward as we move into the city council races, um, that are happening in June in thinking about how do we get organizers, artists, and electeds in the same room talking about these issues. And so through these strategic art practices. The last thing that I wanted to show is um, some of the work that I've been doing in the space of mutual aid through, um, this is the radical pastor Juan Carlos Ruiz. You can go to the next slide. This is in his church, the Good Shepherd Lutheran Church where Tacombi, which is this amazing uh, Mexican restaurant has donated all of this hot meals and all of this food. Go to the next slide. And it became a hub and continues to be a hub for artists and creatives to kind of get involved and help the local community. This is down in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Um, this is the artist Guadalupe Maravilla. This is the artist Jared Videra. And so many other artists and creatives have come through. And the reason why I'm showing this is because this is about creating systems on the local level to um, not only support our most vulnerable communities, and in this instance, in the Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, Juan Carlos Ruiz is helping um, undocumented immigrants all throughout South Brooklyn with getting them food. These are people that can't eat and don't have money for it, with getting them money, and also with providing a space where there's creative output. So. Um, Guadalupe Maravilla and myself have started a healing practice there on the weekly. I do guided meditations and Guadalupe does um, sound bath work, which is really incredible. There's a whole network of other artists that have arts classes there and, um, uh, and a collective that's specifically around fabrication that relates to sewing a collective around um, music. And these are 
So these are sort of the ways that when we talk about dismantling harmful systems at the top, it's really about investing in our local, um, in our local, literally as local as it gets communities in our surrounding blocks, in our surrounding neighborhoods. And mutual aid is not charity work. Mutual aid is about creating solidarity, creating power at the most local level so we can dismantle the systems at the top. And so what I would recommend is for folks that are interested to literally go to Mutual Aid NYC. I'll put the link in the chat and try and get activated there. So if you go to the next slide, and this is my last slide, I'm having a panel on all of this tomorrow called Healing Mutual Aid and Moving Forward. It's on Zoom. I'm a, currently a civic engagement fellow at Pratt Institute, which is an amazing position for two years, um, where it's about bringing to doing all this work that I'm doing in terms of bringing um, civic engagement to the arts. And so we'll be having Guadalupe Maravilla, the pastor Juan Carlos Ruiz, city council candidate Sandy Nurse, speaking tomorrow about how to stay energized and activated um, moving into this next chapter, no matter what happens with the election, hopefully it all goes well. Um, th this is where our energy needs to kind of be focused is on ourselves, our bodies and bringing it full circle to what we did at the beginning of my talk to just ground in ourselves and to stay energized so that we can continue to do the work um, that is so essential right now. So I sound like a hardcore activist. I am a hardcore activist. Um, and I'm an artist that is very concerned about what's going on. And I hope that all of you stay energized, fired up, and, and I'm excited for what's next. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. That was amazing. Um, so inspirational. The work is just, it's smart and generous and fun. And I can't wait to uh, see what you do next. And um, I think you've illustrated for the community just so many ways that people can take action um, given their artist superpowers and resources. So thank you so much for that. Um, next up, uh, our second featured presenter tonight is Pun Bandu. Pun is an actor and a producer and an activist and the co-founder of the OB award-winning Asian American Performers Action Coalition, APAC. Um, Pun's a longtime friend of A4, and I'm super excited to hear about um, APAC's visibility report and uh, how it's been received um, and its impact. So um, I give you Pun. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thanks, Evie, for setting all this up and for helping us through all of making this a really smooth uh, event. I think these types of town halls are so important for creating community. Um, uh, they gave me permission to do this. I, I personally do not like uh, it when I can't see who I'm talking to. Um, so if you guys would, would, in, uh, would, would uh, humor me, uh, would those who are, who are willing to, would you, would you be able to start your video so that I, so that we can all see each other? And, um, I want this to be much more of a dialogue because I want to learn from you guys as well. I, I hate it when, um, when I can't, uh, interact completely. I'm a performer, so I need to connect, you know, and also unmute yourselves. Um, I like it when, when I can hear people's laughing or or reactions or um if someone has a reaction to something i might i might I, w I might invite you to to share your response to the things that i'm about to to, to talk about um so i evie could you show me the gallery view is that possible so that i can see yeah Ivy, you need to stop sharing for a second so he can see um Oh, fabulous. Look at all these beautiful people. Yay. Uh, this is so important, I think, for a community. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I just want to thank Amy, too, for the inspiration of her talk. Like, it was really, it's like, where do I get one of those capes? Uh, signing up. Uh, that was gorgeous. Uh, but also, I think it's so important, as we've, we've seen in the past four years, how important that type of public protest and making noise and saying, no, this is not okay, is to changing people's perceptions, to, to creating sort of 
what, what can be said and what can't be said and speaking out against injustice. Um, I think it's so important. What I'm gonna talk about is more about dismantling the system from the inside in a way. I think it's two different ways of working and I think they're both really needed. They both, in a way, sort of those working outside the system sort of pushes, pushes the system sort of further towards a more progressive, I, I think, agenda. Um, but you also need people working on the inside as well and, um, and, and sort of helping to uh, slowly dismantle that house brick by brick, you know, and without, um, by, by dismantling in a different way, you know, dismantling people's ideas of what is possible, dismantling, um, sort of raising their levels of consciousness, I think, to, to really see what is happening. And, and I think that's sort of been the path of APAC. Just to take a step back, um, first of all, uh, I, I wanna know like who I'm talking to. How many, how many people here? So APAC stands for the Asian Performers Action Coalition and we're a group of performers. I'm just wondering how many people here are consider themselves performers? Raise your hands. Great, I see you, Chen. Uh, Anj Anjali, yes? No? Okay. Um, how many people here are directors? I see my friend Nana here, Dakin is here. She's a director, I know that. Uh, Arpita, am I saying your name right? Um, and unmute yourselves, guys. Um, it's Arpita, just Arpita. emphasis on the first syllable. <laughs> and uh, uh, I know Nana as well. We're fabulous. Directors and friends. Nana's sort of the hub of many wheels. Uh, I think. She's everywhere. Um, and uh, uh, how many people here consider themselves um, visual artists? Great, I see you, Amy. Great, fantastic. Uh, it, what about writers? Any writers in the room? Fantastic. A lot of multidisciplinary too, I see. I see you, Kath. Um, I see you, E.B., fantastic. Um, any, uh, what, are, what, are, what are some other uh, artists that people consider themselves that I haven't, uh, that I haven't mentioned? Andrea Louie, I, I see that you're here as well. Fantastic. I think, I think administrators as well also have to have an artistic understanding, especially when you're, you're an administrator of, um, of an artistic institution. Um, any other art forms here that I haven't uh, called out? Filmmakers? Dancers. I'll just put out there that producers can be artistic, but I know we sit on the other side. <laughs> I love that, Cynthia, and thanks for being here. Cynthia, by the way, uh, you guys, is part of, uh, she is, has created a commercial producers platform uh, of BIPOC producers, which is so exciting. I don't know if you saw that in American Theater Magazine. Uh, Cynthia, do you want to talk about that for like two seconds? She's going to talk about it in the in the pitches afterwards. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Punda. That's very nice. And Miranda's here as well. And Miranda's here as well. Fantastic. Wow, great. Um, so let me let me take a step back a little bit. Um, I, I love that there are so many uh, artists in the room. Um, I my my journey as an artist, um, first of all, I'll take it even a, a further step back to college. I have to tell you guys sort of something that I like to own up to or fess up to is that um, uh, I, I, in college, I used to shun organizations like this, like the Asian Students Association, because I thought, well, first of all, I, I, I grew up, I went to an international school. And so there, like everyone was different around me and diversity was, was, was upheld as sort of, you know, something that we cherish. And, um, and so when I went to college, I, my thinking was, was, you know, I can get along with so many different people. I don't want to pigeonhole myself and just hang out with Asians for, for my, you know, networks and my, and my friendships and stuff. And, um, and even when I went to grad school for acting, I, I was lucky enough to get into the, the Yale School of Drama. Um, I felt like I was going to be different as an actor. I was going to break down barriers that you know, previous Asian actors hadn't been able to before. The arrogance of, of, of me. Um, 
And it wasn't until after I graduated from, from school, and school was such a fantastic uh, experience for me to actually develop who I was as an artist, to be able to play so many roles. And at school, as, as I'm sure many of you have this experience, everything is colorblind cast. You know, you're, you're, you're stretching, you're, you're allowed to play all these different roles. And um, that's sort of where I came from in a way at international school, everyone was able to play all these different roles. And, um, and, and so it was such a huge shock for me when I came, when I graduated in 2001. And uh, like 40% of all of my auditions required me to do an Asian accent. Um, I probably would not have come this far if I, if I hadn't been able to do an Asian accent. Um, and uh, so many of the roles that I was going in for were so stereotypical. And I, I got a lot further than, you know, like I, I was happy with where my career was going, but I realized that so many of the roles I was playing were on the periphery or they weren't able to capture who I was as a person and all the multidimensionality that I had to give. You know, it didn't, it didn't, it, I felt like I wasn't seen, that the industry only wanted just a small sliver of who I was. And, um, so I've been, I've been doing it for 10 years. At, for, at, so this is in 2011 now. And um, it was at that point that uh, I was getting a little uh, frustrated. And, <clears throat> and I decided, I, I got a, an audition at a, a theater company that I had been, you know, they, they specialize in new work. And that was sort of where I, I wanted to sort of cut my teeth as, as an actor. And I love that sort of collaborative process, you know, of, 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 of seeing what, of building something that's never built, been here before. And, um, and uh, I posted this on Facebook and I, it, took me, it took me a day. I, I sort of like didn't press send because I was so scared about it in a way. Uh, and what I said was, I said, I'm so happy that I got my first audition at X theater, but I'm really surprised that it took me 10 years um, to be able to get that audition. And I looked back at all the things that they had produced and um, you know, there were only like two other shows in their past 10 years that required Asian actors. And uh, one show was all female Asian actors. And so of course there, there was, there was they, they, they didn't know who I was, of course they, 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 I shouldn't say of course, they hadn't taken the time to, to, to see other types of actors other than uh, what, had, what, what was, let me, let me phrase it this way. They weren't interested in having me come through their doors until one of their playwrights, who was actually a white playwright, actually wrote a character that said Asian. And at that point, they had a scramble because they didn't know Asian actors. And so they, they, they basically, they were like, we need to see everybody. And that was why I got my first audition there. And I was scared to post it because I didn't want to seem like I was a whining actor. I didn't want to seem like um, I was complaining. Um, and and that, that raised like a, a floodgates open. I got like th over 300 comments on that Facebook post where people were like, I've never auditioned there either. I've never auditioned at this theater or that theater. And, and this was coming from Obie award-winning actors that had been in the theater space for over 30 years, people that I admired. I was like, is this what I have to look forward to? Is this why I'm killing myself? You know, is this my future where, uh, you know, we're constantly going to be on the margins and, and never, not only sort of be able to establish a career, a sustained career for ourselves, but also make the money that we need to, uh, you know, because as we all know, when you work in off Broadway or off off Broadway theater, you just so many, so many fine, fantastic artists that I, that I admire have gone by the wayside because uh, of, of the way that the system is set up. And, um, Anyways, as I said, it created this like outpouring and, and, and Ralph Pena at my theater company was like, you know what, I, we need to get people in a room. 
and he gave us a, a room. And um, out of that emerged uh, the steering committee for, the, for, for APAC. And we had a series of roundtable discussions, uh, uh, forums where we had, the first one was for Asian actor, uh, actors, and then, then we added writers, and then we added directors. And uh, you know, there were over like 400, 500 people in a room, everyone felt the same way. And that to me was such an eye opener for me because um, uh, I guess I never thought that my experience was similar to other people. Like I, I guess I always thought that other people were succeeding in ways that I wasn't, or I just needed to try harder, or you know, everyone had a different path. And uh, what was so empowering that came out of this community was uh, the fact that we understood that it's systemic, you know, uh, no matter how talented you are, no matter what school you went to, no matter what, whatever, it, it didn't matter. These were obstacles that all of us were facing uh, to a certain, to one degree or another. And, um, and it was at that point that we were like, you know what, we, it feels like things are getting worse, but we, we don't have the data to back that up. And, uh, how do we, you know, we had all been working um, and we had relationships with different theaters and, um, and networks, but uh, we didn't have the ability to say, here's what's happening. And so at the time, there were no publicly available statistics on representation across New York City theater. And so we actually had to do the hard work of counting up you know, in the past, we, we looked back, this was in 2011, and we looked back five years and we, we were like, okay, what are the numbers? And it's all public information, you know, it's all out there. Um, so let's, let's see, you know, of all the shows that Manhattan Theater Club produced in the last five years, how many were, how many were black? How many were Latino? How many were Asian? Uh, what about the roundabout theater? You know, and um, I'll, I'll show you uh, here, Evie, could you put up my first slide? This is uh, an old statistic from a report that we had, uh, that we, that we uh, released uh, three or four years ago uh, in, in 15, 16, where we, we finally had 10 years worth of data. And remember we had started out in 2011 and looked back five years, so the st stats, actually go back to the 0607 season. And you can see that in the 0607 season, this is on Broadway and at the not-for-profits, there were only 9% of all available roles went to uh, African-Americans, only 2% went to Latinx, Asians were at 3%, Middle Eastern, a Native American, American Indian and disabled actors were all, were all combined less than 1%. The, it, the numbers were so statistically insignificant that we had to group them all into one group at the time. Um, so you can see the orange bar there, if you crook your head you know, to, the, to the left, is my, my, it says minority actors, 15%. So if you look at that orange bar across the board, you can see it, it, things have improved in those 10 years, 15%. Uh, jumping up to 23% in the 20s, you know? And so this, this sort of coincided with when this diversity conversation was sort of became a national conversation around this time in, in, in 2010, 2011. And um, so you can see that things are progressively getting better, but if you look at the, the numbers, look at our numbers for, for Asians. So we went from 3%, and it didn't, we didn't really hit 5% until the 12, 13 season. That was because of the King and I. And it's so, it's so interesting. It's, it's mind blowing to me that one show actually ended up hiring more than half of all of the Asians for that season. Um, and you know, we, all, we all know the King and I and, and you know, the story of, of, of a white woman who comes into, uh, comes into uh, the, the, the civilization of Siam and teaches the king and his uh, subjects how to become more civilized, you know, um, this colonialist perspective. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm of Thai ancestry, so it hits a nerve, um, but, uh, but, but then it dips back down to, to, to 4% 
Um, and, 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 and so when you think about it, like the percentages that we're fighting for, what we're calling progress, really is like the difference between 3% to 4% in, in 15, 16. So that's, you know, that's how we shape progress. Um, and, and another thing I wanted to, to say, again, I told you this was an old stat. Uh, we called ourselves minority actors here. And in our latest report, we actually had a fantastic um, um, discussion with uh, TCG um, and their equity diversity um, leaders. And um, they, they helped us to see that minority was actually a word that was trapping us in old method methods of thinking that, um, you know, while we had been thinking, well, you know, we're not the majority, we're, we're a minority. And so we're just talking purely in terms of uh, proportion and percentages. The, the, root for, the root word in minority is minor, you know, and, and to think that we are less than something or, or, or um, it, it has that implication and it carries that meaning throughout. And, and I think part of an important part of dismantling things is also dismantling our own thinking about, uh, about our position and, and what is possible and, and who we are. Um, so minority, the word minority now feels so weird in my mouth to even say, and when I hear it, like I, 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 I twinge a little bit. Um, and so that's something that I, I just wanted to put out there because it might not be something that, um, that, that people hear in the same way yet, but I think it's, it's getting out there. Um, so let me, let me just stop here and, and I, I'd love to hear sort of how this all hits you. Uh, if, if you guys have similar experiences or, or what you think about terminology and the word minority um, and, and what, 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 what comes to your mind uh, when you look at stats like these? Um, Ibi, can you stop sharing so we can see the gallery view real quick? Great, thank you. Any, any reactions? Um, uh, I was teaching at a university and we were talking about representation and uh, one of the uh, students who's white said, well, if the minority actors are getting all the roles, what will happen to us? Uh, and I said, minority as per what? Because we do make up much of the world. Uh, so uh, that's a way I, I've framed it. Uh, but I'm just wondering also about that sort of, like as you look at the 35% uh, or the increase, there's a lot of times there's this conversation I feel of like, yeah, you're, and of course you're getting all the parts now. Like it's somehow like very hip and like in to be a diversity, I think in all the things, but um, I, I've heard that a lot, which is quite infuriating about how easy it is for uh, actors of certain, uh, mar uh, for marginalized communities. So, yeah. Ha. I mean, that, that, that just goes to show why our stats are so important because there is that public sentiment out there, right? Like when Hamilton did a casting breakdown for their national yes. tour and they were only looking for actors of color, people flipped out. They were like, that is racist. And that is not, you know, that, uh, that goes against our right to audition for it, et cetera, et cetera. And um, there is this perception that when you see these outliers, these these, you know, people think, oh, well, you know, Broadway is so diverse. I went to go see the Tina Turner musical or whatever, you know, um, those are the things that stick out in your mind. But when you look at the entire season, you forget sort of how many all white productions there are, you know, and be because white supremacy is normalized, right? Right, you, right. You, you don't even think about it. You're like, oh, that's how it should be. I'm used to being in a room full of white people. You know, and, and and it doesn't even get challenged. Yeah. Thank you for offering that. Any other reactions? 
And I'm curious, like, what kind of reaction have you gotten? What has, um, what, what do people say when they read the report? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of um, where I was going to go next in terms of how important stats are to, um, were to, to changing people's consciousness around these issues. Um, that, that is just one example of sort of like how people, people, people see the numbers and, and the numbers don't lie. You know, and, and so uh, when we've had large forums with casting directors and directors and, and writers and producers, um, people are, their jaws drop, you know, and one casting director very early on said, you know what, I, I thought my office did a really good job of colorblind casting. Uh, we, we call that inclusive plot casting now. Um, but I guess we, we need to do a better job, you know, and, and so, um, so as a result of, even though the statistics were New York centric, it was happening at a time when these conversations were national. And because we got featured in the New York Times and all of this national press, um, we became sort of the, uh, the mouthpiece for what was happening uh, to the Asian American community. So for instance, what was happening at the Nightingale in La Jolla um, in 2012, I don't know if, everyone knows what happened, but uh, Stephen Sater and Duncan Sheik was doing a musical based on uh, the Emperor of Nightingale, Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale set in China. And uh, they were doing a, a multicultural cast because uh, according to them, they wanted to create a, a, a universality, right? And, um, and, and it turns out that in a cast of 12, they only cast two Asians. <laughs> <laughs> and the the emperor was this white dude, and uh, and 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 so like we sort of became the the linchpin for for that action against them, and 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 sort of even though this was in California, La Jolla, um, across the uh, across the, the continent, and um, uh, and and it really. It, it really was a, a tough nut to crack because we got so much flack from it from the LA Times as well. You know, we were being acute when we, when we said that that it was basically what they were doing was an act of yellow face um, and whitewashing. Uh, there was such blowback. You know, the LA Times was like, "Well, you know, next we're going to be censoring artists, you know, from being able to create the type of art that they, they want to see." And, and, and our argument was always sort of the art that who wants to see, who is your audience? And, 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 and why is it always our stories that, that get universalized? You know, uh, I, I think a more apt term might be co-opted. You know, uh, there are, you know, Asian children never get to see themselves as the emperor. You know, it's always a white guy. And, and um, you know, so, Anyways, we, we became sort of the, that became a huge campaign for us that lasted like over 10 years. Um, yeah, uh, we, we worked, uh, we had a national initiative to call Beyond Orientalism that A4 was part of as well um, to, to sort of tamp that down. And, and, and so it's, it's hard to talk about it, but like 10 years is a long time, you know, like people's, people's consciousness around these issues have changed and moved so much. Um, where I think, I, I, I think something like that would be unthinkable today of what happened with Nightingale. And I think a lot of white theater artists would also be able to see through that veil now. Um, but, but again, you know, because things are so, because things are normalized, uh, things become um, uh, invisible and, and we become even more invisible because of that. So uh, as a result, you know, we, we've also had conversations with like theater companies. Um, and so this is sort of what I was saying in terms of working from the inside. Um, we, have, we, have a, we have strategically decided to approach these conversations with diplomacy in mind and with the understanding that these uh, white people at, at theaters, um, at these white American theaters, our, our potential allies that so much of these issues are 
subconscious um, and implicit. And that um, hopefully if we bring it to, uh, to, to a level of consciousness, they'll do better. And, and so for, for a period of years, we released reports where things were getting progressively better. And we were able to say, oh, look, you know, um, uh, Asian actors increased by 2% and Latino actors increased by 3% and, or whatever. Um, African-Americans uh, certainly have seen, have been the, have been the best, have, have benefited the most in, in the last five years that you've seen in terms of percentages. But, you know, it, then it became about, one, we don't want to, we're pitting ourselves against each other. You know, it's like, it's like crumbs from the table of joy. You know, it's, it's like that the, the, we're, we're, we're fighting against ourselves, against those few slices that are available at the pie. And it's like, that's a function of white supremacy as well, you know? And, and so for our, our last report, we actually grouped all of us together as BIPOC and sort of talked about the statistics in, in relationship to uh, the white numbers so that white supremacy, that theme was front and center and very clear. You know, 80% of writers on Broadway were white. You know, 90% of directors on Broadway were white. Um, and let's go through those stats while we have them. Ibi, could you, uh, we'll just roll them quickly. So the first one is um, actor stats from our latest season, which is the 1718 season. Um, who is visible, who is invisible. So as you can see, um, it's now all the white faces are, are uh, encompass 60, about 62% of all available roles, which is much better than the stats that, that I showed you before. Um, but it's still about two thirds of all roles went to white people. Um, and so like images like that sort of makes it really clear. It's sort of, sends that message home much clearer, I think, than, than, than the previous image where there were like per percentages and 2% and, 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 and changes year to year. Um, and we've also become much more overt in our language. You know, the thing was our strategy also changed while we were more diplomatic and we were able to get much more traction uh, to help theaters as they diversified. It, it still wasn't enough. It wasn't moving fast enough. And, and what happened this past year and with the last four years of the administration, um, it's really emboldened us where you can actually see it in our language. Uh, white actors continue to be the only race to overrepresent by, by almost double their respective population size. Um, and uh, the next slide, Evie whose stories are being told. 79.1% were white writers. There's no question that the New York theater industry has a bias for white writers. And you can see the breakout on the right side uh, between uh, the nonprofits on the top and Broadway on the bottom. It's a difference between 79.1% and 80%. So it's basically the same. You know, when you, ask, when, you, when you answer the question, who is doing better, the nonprofits or Broadway? The nonprofits are doing a little bit better nominally, but it's, 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 it's um, right now at least, it's, uh, it's, it's barely distinguishable between the two. There are, the biases run across the board. Next slide, Evie. Uh, is, I'm oh, sorry, the, the, yeah, you skipped past the third one, sorry about that. Yes, who gets to shape the stories, directors, 85.5% white across the industry, 84.6% white at the nonprofits, 93.8% white on Broadway. And I should also say that the report goes into much more nuance and detail. So make sure you see the whole report if, if this is new to you. Um, but uh, it's 93.8% white, but it's also interesting to note that every single story or play or project that was written by a BIPOC writer was directed by a white director. And 100% was directed by white people. And it's just interesting to me that like when you think about 
whose vision is able to speak, you know, to tell these stories, um, that it's really difficult for people to give up for, 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 for people. It's more easy, I should say, for, for white people to be in control of those, of, of, of that. And, and what we found too was that um, the, the, the few, the examples where BIPOC directors working in the non-for-profit space was able to direct plays written by white people was only like seven, ha only happened like 7% of the time. So it, it, it and, and, <laughs> and a lot of the cases, it was mostly Shakespeare. You know, there were dead writers, dead white writers. And so, um, the opportunities for BIPOC directors are just so slim, it's really disheartening actually, um, that when it opens, it's only when there is a BIPOC show that is talking about a specific culture. And again, as I said, that's not true 100% of the time. So, um, so social media has been a really important part of, uh, of the response and part of this action. Um, uh, and, and we're, you know, we're ready to shame people for their record. It's, you know, wh whereas before we worked with the roundabout uh, in, a, in a private closed door session in regards to a, uh, a, a, a musical that they did, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, where they actually cast white actors in the roles of, of um, uh, Sri Lankan characters. <clears throat> and smeared with brown makeup, you know, gesticulating with like Bollywood style um, gesticulations. And uh, I remember being in that theater and, and being the only person not laughing, you know, and it just felt so uh, marginalizing. Um, so in the past, we have had these conversations offline in closed door discussions and um, but now we're actually saying, hey, you know, this is, this is the public record. And, and so one of the things that we did for this last report was we actually looked at the economic impact, that it's not, so, it's not even about uh, the representation of numbers anymore. Like you saw that it was like 62% white actors. That's still an improvement. And in, in past years, we might've said, you know, yay, it's an improvement. Um, but really we wanted to look at the bigger picture, which was that, you know, where, where were, were those employment opportunities taking place? And we found that the roundabout was the clearest, uh, was the biggest um, uh, offender actually, when it came to wage gap, because uh, so many of their projects were being produced. So many of the BIPOC projects that, were, that they were um, producing were being done in, Small, their smaller spaces, which also has uh, smaller contracts and less money, and and coupled with the almost total employment of white actors on their Broadway stages, led to this huge disparity, where we said for every dollar spent on a BIPOC actor, the Roundabout spent six dollars and nine cents on white actors. So that became, um, you know, we got, a, we got a lot of traction for that. People were calling on the roundabout to respond. And actually social media was a space where they actually did respond. Uh, and, and so that's just an example of how um, things are changing because of, of these conversations. Um, but uh, as much as I say that our tone has gotten a little bit more militant and trenchant, um, I, I do want to say that I, I do still believe that it's important that we work with people um, because otherwise uh, things won't change as an industry. So um, yeah, any, any responses to that? May I? May I? Please. Yeah, uh, it's been extremely interesting subject for me to listen. I am from, Jap I'm Jap uh, from Japan. I'm an immigrant here, but there is too many, so I cannot say everything right now, but this is something I've been thinking so deeply as an artist for my entire, I am a director directing a career in USA. You just told the King and I, 
that when you explain, I know as a director, I know there is no limitation, no restriction when actor want to transform into character, to get any character, because Ken Watanabe, for example, who was a king in the Broadway, mm -hmm. he can perform probably this kind of character in United States. But when he go back to Japan, he is a big star. He has every character in the world, because in Japan, all Asian. Many other he can perform everything with no doubt. Nobody doubt it. The audience doesn't doubt it. And also, like he bring his own Shakespeare performed role to London. London audience doesn't have no problem about it. For actors, if I talk about arts, artistic form as an acting, artistic form as a directing. There shouldn't be no limitation, what you do. But if you, you are the Asian, live in United States or many other countries, I think it's so nonsense that you as an actor have to limit what you can perform, what character you can perform in your lifetime as a career. Then I've been thinking about this is because Japan is like a, how do you say, uh, homogeneous country and this is diversity country. So I shouldn't, I'm not sure because I am still outsider. I don't know how I balance my idea, how I understand this. But as a simply purely as a performing arts, after there shouldn't be no limitation. And that I've been doing, I've been doing this since I graduate my university as a directing program in the United States. I've been thinking, same thing as a director. Me as an Asian director, especially women, they don't believe I can, they, they believe nobody want to see I direct Chekhov, I direct something. The producer wouldn't fire me. I did everything in my, my like a Yates, Chekhov, Shakespeare in my school. I, but when you're outside, unless you do it, I think it's not about hiring, not, they kind of set their mind, the audience wouldn't want to see it. But it's, I don't think it's true, but it's a too big issue, too complicated issue, but that's I've been thinking a lot. And I truly believe, I probably don't understand real American social issue because I didn't born here, I didn't grow up here, but as a purely as an artist, as a performance art base, there shouldn't be no limitation and audience can enjoy it. Who is not trusting this? That's I've been thinking about it. It should be trusted. You, that's why we have to show it. We have to do it. But we have always obstacle of funding or you know, popularity or something, but I, I, that I've been thinking, I'm sorry there is no solution, but I, it's been really, I've been thinking, but I believe it. As actors, there shouldn't be no, no limitation and we enjoy it. I agree with you, Sonoko, thank you. I do believe that there should not be limitations. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, Evie, you can uh, you can stop sharing um, those. You can stop sharing Pun's slides right now. Um, thank you so much, Pun. Um, now I would like to um, have the next presenters ready to go, and um, we'll have two minutes per person. We're actually now running a little bit behind, so. Um, <laughs> Georges will go first, uh, and then Arpita, and then uh, Sunoko, you'll have two minutes again, and then Miranda and Cynthia. So um, Georges, you have two minutes, and then I'm afraid I am gonna have to mute you um, if you go over. <laughs> so <laughs> go ahead and uh, please uh, share your, um, your project with us right now. Thanks, Georges. You're welcome. Hi, my name is uh, Georges, Georges Bridges, and I'm from the Asian American Film Lab. And um, we've been around since approximately 1998, and we promote ethnic and gender diversity in the film industry. I'm here to promote 
one of our oldest programs, Unfinished Works. Whether you're a writer or a director or screenwriter or just someone with an idea and you want to get some type of feedback on your idea in the form of your film or your, your play or, or your project, we can possibly help you. We would provide a free space if you meet certain criteria and are selected to present your work and get feedback. Um, if you would like to contact us, that would be www.asianamericanfilmlab.org. One of our projects, upcoming projects is on November 20th. It's called Two Countries and it's about four high school girls who meet, four Asian high school girls who meet at a summer, a summer camp. Um, I would encourage you to go to our website and look at that as well as any of our other programs and projects. And as I mentioned, that would be on November 20th and we look forward to seeing you at our events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georges. Okay, um, next, oh, I'm sorry, you wanna show your video. I apologize, go yeah. ahead and show that. Have you ever watched a TV show or a movie and wondered what went into the writing of it or wish that you yourself could be a part of that writing process? Well, now's your chance. The Film Lab's Unfinished Works program first gives you the opportunity to watch as professional actors read aloud a screenplay in progress, and then gives you the opportunity to yourself be a part of that creative process by participating in a workshop with the writer and giving your thoughts and your insights to assist in the script's development. I'm Keelan Bowles. Unfinished Works is Film Lab's longest running program. We connect writers and actors and the public to exhibit and support diverse and cutting edge stories and artists to create a dialogue about issues that affect us all through the medium of television and film. I'm Ginger Yifen Chen. This fall, the Film Lab invites you to a live online workshop every month, every third Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific. We have an amazing lineup of science fiction, historical satires, and noir thrillers. Please learn more in RSVP at www.film-lab.org. That's film-lab.org. Great, thank you so much. Um, You're very welcome, Lisa. All right, next up, Arpita, uh, Hypocrite Theater Company. Hi, everyone. Um, I thought I had three, two. Okay, I'm going to go really fast. <laughs> uh, my name is Arpita, and I'm the artistic director and co founder of Hypocrite Theater Company, which has been around for about six years. Um, our focus is we work exclusively with writers of color with a specific focus on South Asian storytellers. Uh, we work on impossible, uh, will never get produced plays and musicals. Um, so when COVID hit, we looked at these plays and we wondered how, how we could mount our impossible plays and reach even more audiences at this time. We listened, we planned and learned a lot and uh, are now ready to mount our virtual season of 2021. If you could go to the next slide. Our first production is uh, Bollywood Kitchen by Sri Rao, which we're co-producing with, uh, with Geffen Playhouse and talking about trying to dismantle from the inside, um, and, which is written by Sri Rao. And in this show, he'll be cooking his signature chicken curry or chickpeas, and you can cook along with him. You'll get a box of ingredients, and he's gonna talk about his life um, uh, growing up in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Yay, Pennsylvania. Uh, and his attachment to Indian food and Bollywood films. Uh, there's gonna be clips from Bollywood films and also a Bollywood DJ party. Uh, and if that sounds exciting to you, I hope you'll be interested in partnering with us as a producing partner or a community partner for the remainder of our season and specifically a virtual production of Running by Danny Pudi. If you could go to the next slide. Some of you may know Danny from Community or Mythic Quest or DuckTales. Danny grew up a Polish Indian American, but never knew his Indian dad. He reconnected with him a few years ago after becoming a father himself, but just a few months after that, his father passed away. For the past year, Danny and I have been developing a show about his journey to go figure out his father. And this journey actually takes place within an interactive video game. If you go to the last slide, 
As Danny's avatar collects objects from his dad's apartment and meets people from his father's life, the audience goes along and sometimes even guides Danny on which road to take. It's a moving and funny tale resonant at this time of division because it's about searching for identity, understanding, and forgiveness all through a video game. Uh, our goal is to create another engaging production with particular attention of audience engagement and the experience. We really believe in pooling our resources uh, with a partner will be great as the Geffen and Hypocrite partnership has been. We're looking for any kind of thing, financial, resource sharing, cross promotion. And here's a little clip from a reading we did. Where am I from? Okay, I mean, I guess it depends on who's asking, right? If they're wearing Chicago sports gear, I'm from Chicago. If they are speaking Polish, mam rodzinę w Białymstoku i Warszawie. If they're South Asian, I'm from Andhra Pradesh. And if it's a white nationalist, my answer is a white woman's birth canal, just like you. And then I run. <laughs> I'm from a family of immigrants that made tremendous sacrifices to get me here today. Okay, so when I was 11 years old, um, I went to Poland. I was excited to see where I was from for the very first time. I thought everything would make sense. We boarded this bus in Warsaw when I heard the word spowrotem. Spowrotem means to go back. I turned my head and I noticed this man. He was staring at me. Spowrotem, he said once again. He was telling me to go back. At the time, my impulse wasn't to run, but to correct him and say, actually, I'm 49% Polish, 23 in Miseso. So technically, you can only send half of me back. But I didn't speak. I pretended... To Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks, Arpita. Um, next is uh, Sonoko um, from Crossing Jamaica Avenue. Yeah. You have two minutes. I know. So, Evie, please flip the slide when I say next, please. I'm still excited and sorry, I'm not calm. So, my company, Crossing Jamaica Avenue, is a brick. To bring audience original theater experience, that unique meld of West and the East. So, uh, since its inception by Japanese migrant artists, we have been devoted to produce hybrid productions. If you do please go next slide. Yes, like we do a barber and no barber, no barber, and please next. And the series of readings of Japanese plays, uh, Japanese plays about atomic bombing or nuclear plant disaster. And next, please. And we try to reach out to young audience with our folk tale inspired productions to discuss about social issues which we found in the inherited stories. And next, please. So we start this theater to go, which is very interactive uh, theatrical experience uh, at home or classroom. So currently we intentionally limit the audience like a 20 up to 25 people to make this uh, interactive tangible experiments. So we are try planning to tour it's like a virtual tour to any schools, classroom, or any community group, which will give very personal touch to the audience. So if you are interested in, uh, please uh, contact us. I will show you where you can contact. And the last slide, please. So uh, now we desperately need a uh, notion of bridging bridges. So we're going to have an in-person, online hybrid project next year, 2021. And we really would like to contribute to bridge the isolated ideas through our production. So please uh, like, like, uh, please, uh, like our Facebook or visit our website uh, for our update. Thank, Thank you so much, Sunoko. I appreciate that. Um, and then last uh, um, in the one minute, two minute pitches tonight is uh, um, the industry standard group, Miranda Go and Cynthia Tong, you're up. Hi everyone, my name is Cynthia J. Tong. Hi everyone, Miranda Go here. 
Um, we're two of the founding members of the Industry Standards Group. Uh, TISG is the first completely BIPOC commercial theater investment and producing organization in the country. Our pillars of, of our mission are access, disruption, and support. Our focus is on promoting work reflecting the diversity of our country, increasing the presence of BIPOC investors and producers in the commercial producing field, and expanding the access and opportunities granted to BIPOC communities within the industry. Uh, we recently launched two weeks ago, um, but over this past year, we've discovered that about 98% of producers and investors on Broadway are white. Um, reflecting on this racial inequality, we wanted to change the perspective that BIPOC folks don't really see themselves as stakeholders in the commercial theater and wanted to create our own narrative that we are and can be a part of it. So with the industry standard group, we're proposing a new way of thinking about funding on Broadway with the goal of creating more access points for BIPOC in commercial producing. Um, to learn more, you can visit our website, the industrystandardgroup.com, or follow us on social media at TISG underscore fund, or you can email us at connect at the industrystandardgroup.com. Miranda and I have also included our personal email addresses at the bottom here. We can also put them in the chat. Uh, just to say that I think many people don't see themselves as producers or ever having wanted to or been able to have a financial stake in the process. And so we are inviting all, all people theater audience members, theater artists, people who have always wanted to be producers to join us in this. And we're gonna be rolling out of several things over the next few months. So we hope if you're interested, you follow us. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, appreciate that. Um, all right, so I um, that was a lot. <laughs> I think we all believe now in the power of community and uh, for us by us. So like no one's going to do the work for us. We got to do it for ourselves. Um, and that's why communities like this are so important. So um, whoops. You, you made it on time. So anyway, um, thank you everyone for that. We're going to open it up for um, quick 30 second pitches. I know Jessica Chen wants to give a little pitch. Maybe you can stop sharing right now. Um, and uh, Jessica, anybody else who would like to give a 30 second pitch, um, you can raise your hand and or just um, put your name in the chat box and we'll let you go in that order. So um, Jessica, uh, you want to go ahead and uh, I'll, get, I'll give you 30 seconds. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jessica Chen here. I'm artistic director and choreographer of J Chen Project, 501c3 modern dance company based here. Uh, she, her, hers, and I'm here on stolen land of the Lenape people. Um, I, my company just premiered a dance film called I Can Almost See You, and it is, um, I, I'm a contemporary and modern dance choreographer, but my background goes back to Chinese folk dance. And I've kind of pulled those roots back into, um, into my work. So it is a Chinese folk dance inspired contemporary piece that uh, I will drop in the chat. So feel free to see the Chinese, a Taiwanese dancer dancing to on Broadway and all over New York. And uh, we filmed it in the pandemic. So that's all. Thanks. Jessica, please share the link. It's a great piece. Um, Nana, Nana Dickin, you want to uh, you want to give a 30 second pitch? I do. All right. It's on you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nana Dakin. My pronouns are she, her. I'm here on behalf of the Thai Theater Foundation, which is a US-based nonprofit uh, supporting contemporary Thai theater artists. And we have an event that I'm going to drop in the chat right now, which is going to be next week, November 18th, um, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern time on Zoom that um, is open to Thai theater makers and goers. Great, thank you so much, uh, Nana, that was great. And thank you for sharing that link. Um, we will um, definitely, we'll send that out um, to everybody who gets a copy of the deck and they'll have access to this, or you all can, um, 
uh, copy the chat if you want. You can save the chat. There's uh, like three little dots at the very bottom of the chat box and you can click on that and you can save it so you can keep those links forever and ever on your messy desktops, probably not as messy as mine. Um, so thank you everyone. Special thanks to um, all of our, our participants and especially our two featured presenters. So um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I um, really enjoyed learning about what you're doing and thank you for making that, um, those efforts, uh, Poon and Amy, let's, let's, let's be that change. Um, let's see it happen. So thank you all. We're gonna, um, we only have like uh, 10 minutes now. So we're gonna break out into um, three rooms so you can just, have an opportunity to um, chat with people, ask questions, introduce yourself, just say who you are, pass it on. Um, and then also please, 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 um, if you can fill out the, um, the survey, we really appreciate it either, either now or um, tomorrow um, when you get the email follow-up. So thank you, thank you. And um, I am going to attempt to uh, break us out right now.
Well, some of us made it back. All right. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining tonight. Um, Again, thanks to Ibby for helping organize this and to the whole A4 team. Thank you all, everybody. Um, hopefully we'll see you um, next week for the uh, Reimagining Diversity panel. And uh, feel free to reach out with any questions and we'll follow up again with the survey and the slide deck for tonight. So thanks everybody. Um, let's pose for a picture, say cheese. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>